to drive it to Green's Fair. I want to be able to drive it to Green's Fair, which is 19th to 27th. Good evening, everybody. Father, and we do have the words up here, so you don't need to look it up on your phones like I had people do last week. to set our hearts and minds on things above. And Paul says this to the church in Colossae. 
uh, which, by the way, is one of the only unexcavated biblical sites left in the world. And it's on my bucket list to go and do a dig there one day. So if you think about me and you want to pray about something, pray about that one day, please. Thank you. That would be amazing. Paul says to the church, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And that's the part that I want to focus on right now is that this is a spiritual act of worship. Sing-alongs, period, are fun, right? But this is so much more than a sing-along. This is us singing to God and one another so that we can have the peace that Paul is talking about here, mm -hmm. so that we can express our gratitude to God and that we can rejoice individually and collectively for who God is and all that he does in our lives. So with that in mind, we're going to continue with What a Fellowship, number 385 in your songbooks. So 385 in the book. So this is a song about gratitude for the fellowship that we have because of Jesus. All right? It sounds a little like a drinking song, but it's not. I promise. <laughs> All right. Or the right kind of drink. <laughs>
Cindy and the ladies on that one because that was hot. And now 223, Anchor for the Soul, which will give our vocal cords a bit of a rest, but is such a great song about setting our minds on the things above, on eternal things. scripture, I like to give a little bit of context because it's important to know what type of scripture we're reading. Is the Bible all from God? Yes, absolutely. Should we take it as God's word? Absolutely. 
Are there different ways to understand scripture based on who wrote it, to whom, and when? Yes. Absolutely. And the more we can understand that, probably the better students of the word we are. And so, the letter to the church in Colossae from Paul is what we have in the Bible as Colossians. And it's an incredible, incredible book. And if I could sum it up, I would say this is a letter about how amazing Jesus is. This is a letter all about Jesus and the supremacy of Christ Jesus and how we're made in his image and we can actually put on the image of Christ and how we find our identity in Christ, just how Christ is supreme above all. And then Paul puts some legs on this letter. Because Christ is supreme, here's how we as citizens of his kingdom should act and think and treat one another and treat the world. That's what this book is all about. And uh, on your own time, maybe even this week, read through the book of Colossians. That, that would be a great idea. And if you need some encouragement, if you need some inspiration, if you need a, a really strong reminder of what it means to be a disciple of, of Jesus, you'll find all of those things in this book. We're going to focus in particular on chapter 3 today. Uh, Paul is writing to remind these Christians who they are because of who Jesus is. And he, he doesn't write his letters just to whom it may concern, just like Jesus doesn't preach his sermons to whom it may concern. He's preaching to the people then and there and also to us here and now. And the same thing is true with Paul when he writes a letter. It's not just, uh, here are some random thoughts I had, let me write it down for all time to be canonized in the scripture. No, he's led along by the Holy Spirit uh, because of a particular situation in a particular place and time. And it's really important for me because I, I need evidence sometimes. I know we're supposed to have faith, which is being certain of what you do not see. But also, it's good to have evidence for beliefs sometimes so that you can back it up or that you can lean on that sometimes when you need uh, to, to win an argument. <laughs> Although maybe that's not the best reason to do that. But Colossae is a real place in Asia Minor. And uh, it used to be on the coast. It's not on the coast anymore because as the river that runs through Colossae and as the Mediterranean Ocean moves back and forth, uh, the river deposits sediment and the, the ocean uh, creates land basically through the tides. And so the coastline moved actually uh, more than 60 miles over the time. From, from when Paul was writing this letter to now. And so it's no longer on the coast. And actually because of that, uh, it lost prominence soon after actually the first century. Um, but, but still, there was a lot of really important things happening in this town. Uh, it's between Europe and Africa and Asia. And so it's sort of the confluence of a lot of different cultures and languages and religions. And in this place in particular, there was a lot of mystic religions that relied on secret knowledge, sometimes uh, called Gnosis or the Gnostics. Uh, that, was a, that was a line of thought that had been around for, for a long, long time uh, before Paul wrote this letter. Uh, and, and Gnosticism was working its way into the church. Not only that, but um, Jewish sort of legalism was also working its way into the church. And all of these different traditions were blending together and people were sort of creating their own religion in the image of the culture rather than a religion based on the image of Jesus. And so it's to all of that that Paul writes this letter. And he's writing to them then and there, but I think it's also for us here and now. So why are we reading this? Because... I think it's important that we remember the religion that we're practicing and more than that, the person of Jesus that we're following and don't allow ourselves to be clouded by so many other things. Or in other words, to set our hearts and our minds on the things that are above. Uh, one of the things I just came from uh, the, the, the summit, the, the big conference with our churches from all over the world. And one of the things that I heard over and over again is uh, that the international brothers and sisters were so surprised at the disunity that they saw in our fellowship of churches in the U.S. and they didn't understand it. Because we're all brothers and sisters, we're all Christians, and a lot of the lessons, in fact, 
were about the disunity that's in the U.S. and, and the international brothers and sisters are like, I have no idea what he's talking about. Because we're just following Jesus. And that was a surprise to me. Because I kind of think, stuff we're going through, everybody must be going through. But sometimes it's just not the case. It's just not the case. And I think it was convicting to hear that over and over and over again from our international brothers and sisters. And I think we should feel an upward call and maybe even inspired and convicted by that perspective. I heard so many times, we're just trying to follow. We don't have time to disagree with one another like that because we agree on the most important things. And I think that's what Paul is trying to get across too. There's not time to disagree on so many other things. Or, or in other words, we can agree to disagree on so many other things as long as we are following the same Jesus. That's the most important thing. <clears throat> and I don't want us to be divided over things that are important and things that matter but are not the most essential. If we can agree on the most essential, then we can disagree on a whole lot of other things and still remain in fellowship and loving relationships with one another. It often happens, and just happened yesterday actually, we were inviting somebody to church, Lauren and I, and, uh, with politics and religion, people tend to be one issue voters. And everybody has the one issue that they're gonna ask you to determine who you are. And depending on what you answer, they're gonna say, yes, I'm in line with you, or no, I'm not, and I don't have time for you. That happens in politics, and it happens in religion. And people ask me, what do you think about abortion? What do you think about Trump? What do you think about Biden? What do you think about gas prices? What do you think about inflation? And that's just not my role, you know? Yeah. Those are important issues. And we should, as a fellowship, spend time talking about those things and figuring out what would Jesus say and do in this situation? And by the way, I don't hold a monopoly on that answer. I think we all do. And we all bring our lenses and we have valuable things to contribute. But the, the job of the church is not to respond to the 24-hour news cycle. That's just not the yeah. job of the church. No. The job of the church is to point people towards Jesus. That's right. And to whatever degree we can in the faith that we have and whatever level of spirituality we have to reflect Jesus to one another and the community around us. That's the job of the church. That's right. And that's a big job. That's and if true. we allow ourselves to be divided over things that are important but not essential then the reflection of Jesus gets a little more tainted. And a little more tainted, and people don't see the real Jesus. They see Jesus filtered through our own opinions and our own culture. And I'm not saying we don't talk about those things. We should, but the job of the church is to reflect Jesus. Let's look at this passage because even now, some of you are agreeing with what I say, I'm sure, and some of you are disagreeing with what I'm saying, which I'm okay with. But let's just look at this passage of Scripture. Colossians chapter 3. I should probably have my Bible if we're going to read that Scripture. Colossians chapter 3. Paul says this. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now, I believe we probably all agree on this scripture. I think we probably all think, absolutely, we should set our hearts and minds on things above. I think probably where we disagree is when we are doing that. I think we probably agree it's important to think about the kingdom of God and godly things and heavenly things. But the difference, and maybe where we disagree sometimes, is what exactly does that mean? When is it we are thinking about the things above? And what would that look like? You know, there's probably a lot of freedom in that answer. There probably is. I mean, Paul talks about freedom in Christ for a reason because we don't all have to agree. 
And actually, that's the beauty of a diverse fellowship of churches. I was interacting with uh, some church leaders outside of our fellowship, and you know what they said was, in the International Churches of Christ, we have never seen a fellowship of churches that is so diverse and stays together. We have never seen it. And these are people who run in all of the mega church circles. And, and they see the value in that, and they don't know how to do it. And I'm not saying I know how to do it, but I think if we can focus on the most important thing, yeah. we can remain in fellowship even if we degree, disagree on some other really important things. Yeah. But if we ever start to disagree on the most important thing, or even the function of the church and why we are here as a fellowship, well then, the image of Jesus starts to get clouded yeah, that's true. in our own hearts and to the community around us. So I think probably we disagree, not on the principle that Paul is saying here, but on the application. And the application is something that we can continue to talk about. And we can continue to work out and try to figure out how we agree on the most important things. Paul gives us some hints here on when it is we're thinking about things above versus earthly things. And we'll read that in a second. But first, I want, I want to reference a, a study that came out um, a few years back from Harvard University. And they were doing a long-term, a longitudinal study on mental health and well-being. And in this study, uh, they were going to end it right around the time the Boston Marathon bombing occurred. And they decided not to end it, but rather to continue the study and use subjects in Boston uh, to continue studying how people react to traumatic situations and how people are impacted long term in their mental health. And they had some really interesting findings, just really, really profound findings. And what they found was the people who were most traumatized, most traumatized long term, mentally and emotionally, were not the ones immediately affected by the bombing or even the ones who were friends of the ones who were, or family of the ones who were immediately affected by the bombings. The people who were most traumatized by the Boston Marathon bombing were the people who spent over six hours watching news and social media. Wow. And they were traumatized more than people who were there. Wow. Because when we don't set our hearts and minds on things above and we allow so much to influence us from culture and news or whatever else, it has an impact on us. Yeah. And again, I'm not saying don't listen to the news. I'm not saying don't be on social media. I'm saying what are you allowing to influence you more? The things above or the earthly things? What has a more profound, bigger impact on you? Now, how do we know if we're setting our things, our, our, our minds and hearts on things above or things below? Paul gives us a hint here. Let's pick it up in verse five. Paul says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality and impurity, lust and evil desires and greed, which are idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived. But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. Here, there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Paul gets a bad rap sometimes as like a misogynist because of some of the things that he says about women. And I think there are some really difficult passages uh, about women. Paul also gets a bad rep because he seems like he's all about sort of legalism at times and then he's all about grace at times and he's sort of all over the map. But if we remember that he was writing to real people in real situations and responding to real situations, then, then maybe we can put it in some context. But I think what Paul says here is so radical. 
He, he picks the things that are probably most divisive in that time in the church. There's no Greek or Jew. Do you know to people then and there, that is, that's crazy to say. Because Jewish people would have thought we are forever and all time God's one and only chosen people. And the Greeks would have thought, well, those people are weird and they're super arrogant. And uh, I don't want to be like them even if we're in the same church. And Paul says, there's no division there. None of those things really make a difference in the kingdom of God. There's no barbarian or Scythian or slave or free. He's saying that none of those earthly ways that we like to categorize and separate people matter in the kingdom of God. It's totally revolutionary. But that's not the only thing that he says here. I just think that's one of the things that we can quickly read over and forget about. Wow. To say something like that at that time. But no, Paul gives us some indicators of when we may be setting our minds on earthly things rather than the things above. And he starts out with what you might call the outward sins of sexual immorality and impurity and lust and evil desires and greed. And those things are the acts of the sinful nature, he calls them in, um, in Galatians. And then there's uh, another book, Ephesians, that, that Paul also wrote that has a very similar list, just like this. And he talks about, man, if we're giving into these things, you're just not setting your hearts and minds on things above. Because there's an earthly sort of tainted or sinful version of sexual immorality and impurity and greed. And then there's a heavenly version of those things that's actually good. We're looking to fulfill ourselves with desires that God has given us. But we give into the earthly cheap version of it rather than the God-given version of it. And so uh, let me just say, I think the point that Paul is making here is, man, if, if you're giving into these things, you're just not setting your hearts and minds on things above. And you're not living the life that God has called you to. And it could be so much better. You don't have to give in to the cheap imitation. You can get the real thing. But then he says, I love this because, again, he's making sure we're all on a level playing field. He goes, you used to live that way. Oh, and, and in other places, he says, so did I. We all lived that way. But we were able to be transformed once we came to faith in Jesus. And then he goes a little bit deeper. It's not the outward acts of the sinful nature. Next, it's internal emotions, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language, lying to one another. And that's a bit deeper. And if we're giving into any of those things, if we don't have some level of self-control over our internal selves, that might be an indicator that we're not setting our hearts and minds on the things that are above. And we just need to take a temperature check. Paul gives us a lot of tools in this toolbox to help us see, are we setting our hearts and minds on earthly things or on the things above? And you know what? We all get to make our own choices. But if you want the good stuff, like the real thing, life in the kingdom of God the way God designed for you, then it's time that we set our hearts and minds on the things above and not give in to the earthly things. Let's keep going. In verse 12, just in case Paul hurt anybody's feelings or in case I hurt anybody's feelings, he goes on and says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy, dearly loved. And I think that's important, and I, I'm joking a little bit, but it is important yeah. to know that even if you're giving in to some external sin, or even if you feel like you're jacked up a little bit on the inside, you know what? If you're a child of God, you're holy and dearly loved. No matter how you might feel about yourself or no matter your performance on any given day, that doesn't change how God feels about you. And I think that's a reminder I know that I need, and I think probably we all need. So, Nittany Church, God's chosen people who are holy and dearly loved by God. Paul says this, clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together. This is an indicator 
that we may be setting our hearts and minds on things above. If we can have compassion and kindness and gentleness and patience and forgiveness for ourselves and for one another, then we may be setting our hearts and minds on things above. If we experience our relationship with God as dearly loved children, rather than employees who must produce, or maybe the, the children who are not so dearly loved and kind of left out to try, we don't have to experience Christianity that way. We can experience it as dearly loved, God's chosen. And we can be characterized by compassion and patience and gentleness and kindness for ourselves and for one another. I think we need both reminders, right? Like it's okay to feel convicted sometimes and to be called out and to be held accountable. Yeah. It's not just okay, it's good, it's essential. Yeah. It's essential. And we need that. But it's also just as essential to be reminded that God really loves you. Like more than you imagine. Yeah. With my kids, we always say, I love you. And I'm like, how much do I love you? And I have this whole thing that I say and they always kind of get it right, but not really because it's really long. So I love them out the window and out the door and to the moon and back and throughout the whole universe and back and more. That's what we say, and they never get the whole thing right. And then they try to compete, and they're like, no, I love you more, and I'm like, no, I love you more, and you don't even, you can't even understand how much. And it's the same way with us. Like, when you feel loved by God, you're getting a, a teeny glimpse of his sentiment towards you. And that's really important, because if you can experience your Christianity as dearly loved by God, you're gonna wanna be as close to that love as possible. But if you experience your Christianity as performance driven or that you're never measuring up, you're going to want to distance yourself or harden your heart because we don't like feeling embarrassment and shame, right? And so I think Paul wants us, and more than that, God wants us to be able to experience our Christianity as dearly loved. And to whatever degree you love God right now, he's saying, I love you more. I love you more. Throughout the whole universe and back, I love you more. Dearly loved children. He also references here that we can take off the old self and put on the new self. Which I think is just a beautiful idea. Yeah. We can take off the old self and put on the new self. <coughs> and it's kind of like laundry. Like, there's a lot of laundry in our house. And I didn't realize how much laundry Lauren does until... She didn't do it and I was doing the laundry. And she talks about how much laundry and I'm like, I like help fold sometimes and stuff, but I don't do the laundry in the way that she does the laundry. But when she had the baby, I was like, I got this. I'm gonna do the laundry. And the laundry piled up higher and higher. And I did my best, but man, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And, and actually in our house, we probably have to do the laundry daily. You gotta take off the old, Throw it in the basket, throw it in the washing machine, wash it off, dry it, fold it, give it to the kids, and maybe they fold and put it away, but you know, they fold in quotes and we gotta help them put it away. But there's just a lot of dirty laundry. And if we don't, bring it back to what Paul says here about taking off the old self and putting on the new self. If we don't deal with the dirty laundry and we just try to put on the new self, it's like my son who wants to wear the same shirt every day and he would just put on a clean shirt over top of the old nasty crusty shirt. I used to do that too, so I totally get it. That is not clean. It's nasty. I remember as a little kid, I went to camp and I didn't change all week. And we still have, at our summer camp, we have kids who still do that. Even as much as we try to encourage them, you see them and you're like, man, I don't want your parents to see you like this. Or we're gonna get sued for negligence or something. But I don't know, for whatever reason, kids like to keep on their dirty laundry. They have their favorite little thing. But so do we. Yeah. So do we. We have our little favorite thing that we don't wanna get rid of because it's comfortable, right? And I don't know what it is for each one of us, but I know we're all tempted to have it. Yeah. And sometimes, I mean, it's some of the lists that, that Paul said here. Sometimes it's unrepentant, maybe impurity and immorality. 
Like if, if anybody else knew your search history, how would you feel about that? How would you feel about that? Or maybe it's the internal emotions that you just don't let people in and understand and don't allow people to disciple the internal you and apply Jesus' word to your heart. Because you know what? Nobody else really knows the person behind the eyeballs except you. And so all I'm saying is we all have our dirty laundry. And what Paul tells us to do here is, hey, just take it off and get it cleaned. You know, you can, that, you have that option. As a matter of fact, you have that option every day to take off the dirty laundry and put on the Jesus clothes. That's the language he uses. And it's so simple in the way that he says it. Just, you take off the, the old and the dirty and you put on the Jesus clothes. Because sometimes it, repentance can be that simple. Repentance starts with a change of mind. And then it's carried out by our actions. And it can just be simple. And it just takes a little bit of faith. And it can seem daunting to change anything ever. I understand that. But it doesn't have to be. What are the results of taking off the old dirty shirt and putting on the Jesus clothes? He tells us here in verse 15. And this is the, the passage that we started with earlier. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The result of dealing with our dirty laundry is peace and gratitude and helpful teaching and admonishing with all wisdom and being able to live in the name of the Lord Jesus. I think probably what that means is living in the way that Jesus intended us to. That sounds pretty good to me. That's the kind of Christianity I want to be living out. That's what my hope is for all of you, that you can live out that kind of Christianity. And as we conclude here, I just want to remind us it can be as simple as taking off the dirty laundry, getting it scrubbed, and putting on the new clothes. You don't have to wait for that. Like even tonight, this week, you can get open with whatever it is you feel like you need to get open. You can allow other brothers and sisters in your life to help you out with that. You can, you can get into Colossians for yourself and be inspired yourself. It doesn't have to be filtered by through me or anybody else. This is God's word for you, and may it dwell in you richly. Now we're going to transition to taking communion. And we do this every single week because Jesus told us to. And I think Jesus knew that we need constant reminders of who he is and what he's done and therefore who we are. And so we have this constant reminder, not just that we have to think about, but actually he instituted the communion meal so that we can have material, something to touch and taste and feel to help us remember. And he said, we're supposed to take bread and wine or juice uh, to symbolize Jesus' body that was broken and his blood that was spilled. And so that's what we do when we take communion. And, and in Colossians, Paul has this incredible, this is sort of Paul's uh, theology around Jesus, okay? This is chapter one. So we're backing up a page or two or scrolling up, depending on if you're using electronics. Colossians chapter one, he being Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created, things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He's before all things and in him, all things hold together. And he's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This is what we're remembering and proclaiming when we take communion. 
that Jesus is the personification of God and that through Jesus, God is reconciling the whole world to himself through Jesus' blood shed on the cross. Why don't we pray and then we'll pass the communion elements. Let's pray. Father, thank you that uh, you love us more than we can imagine. And you love us more and more. And uh, God, I pray that we all in this room can experience our connection to you, our relationship to you as dearly loved children. And that rather than being entitled children, rather than taking advantage of your love and your grace, that we would be inspired to be on the path that you've laid out for us and to be the women and the men that you've called us to be. God, we thank you for Jesus, who was a trailblazer of our faith, the author and perfecter of our faith, who is the image of you. And Jesus, we pray, we know that we will never uh, be able to give back to you what you've given for us. But we pray in gratitude, thanking you for your faithfulness, your sacrifice, and your resurrection. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you'd like to, as a part of your reflection, you can join us as we sing 417 in the songbook, Slam of God.
Uh, as we close out here, I just have a couple of announcements for us to be aware of. And the first is that we're going to have combined midweek at 7 p.m. over at the Quankles house. They're going to host. 7 p.m. is good, right? Okay, so combined midweek, 7 p.m. over at the Crankles crib. It should be a lot of fun. And then uh, worship next Sunday, a week from today, is going to be out at Two Deck Park, Pavilion Number 1. And uh, Frank will send out an email regarding the potluck, which is always a big hit. I heard from Caitlin that uh, the potluck was really good last week, so thanks for the inside information there. I was sad to miss it. No, really, I was worshiping with big group of people, but I was like, man, I'm missing the potluck. You know, so I get to be here this Sunday. Come on. That's great. Uh, so look out on your emails for uh, Frank's uh, potluck email there. Also, uh, this is good for everybody to know. I guess all of the students are gone right now, or most of them anyway. Uh, but when the students get back, we're actually going to have uh, Sunday night, the 21st. Is that what that says? 21st. After service, we're going to have a semester planning meeting. And that's going to be for the college students and our college semester plan. Uh, however, if you guys want to join that, that'd be fine. And you can be aware of what's going on with the college students and help encourage them. We are getting some new students, some freshmen in, uh, and you'll be able to meet them probably that Sunday. Uh, and on that note, uh, the, the next weekend, we're going to have a young uh, dating couple in town from New Jersey who uh, were baptized in campus ministry there in New Jersey and come highly recommended and they want to interview uh, for a ministry internship position here. And so you all will get to meet them, Lucas and Tatiana. Um, Lauren and I interviewed them virtually and then I got to sit down with them in person at the conference and they're really, really great people. And uh, they're very eager actually to come here and train for campus ministry. And so um, hopefully we would hire them at the end of uh, that weekend and they'd be able to move in uh, probably early September. And so that's what we're thinking, but I wanna make sure you guys get to meet them first. And uh, so just be on the lookout. I may be tapping some of you to, to get some time with them, okay? Um, does anybody else have any announcements that pertain to the whole church? Okay, great. Well, why don't we close in prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Let's pray. Uh, Father, thank you that we get to worship you and uh, pray that we would do that not just here when we're in this place and when we're together, but that we can worship you with every decision that we make as we go out of this place. And God, I pray that we can reflect Jesus to one another and to our broader community. And I pray that even in spite of all of our mess ups and mistakes and sin, that the world around us can see Jesus in this community. And uh, that you would enable that. Help us to allow your word to dwell in us richly so that we are remade by your word and your teachings. And I pray that we can follow Jesus every day and with every decision. In his name, amen. amen. All right, we're dismissed. Have a great evening, everybody. You do, you do realize what happens on the 19th to the 27th, right? Uh, no. Grange Fair. Oh. Grange Fair. Yeah, that's a big deal, man. Especially for my family, so. Yeah. Have fun. See ya. <laughs> You're going to be MIA for that. I, I already put in for two days. I put in for that, my two days off. I already put in for the night, the 22nd.